Um, if you study and you can think about the meaning of what you're studying, I don't want you just to be here to take my notes. I mean, I have my notes already. I want you to show that you actually can engage with your material. So I want you to think about some of the conversations that we've had outside of your notes, what you've been doing in the lab to not just memorize it, but interact with it. I'll just give you that, just give you that reminder that typically you go up the whole increment as long as you've got everything you need to do in the lab. And so if you average a C on your exams, you typically are giving you a B in the class or you can do it everything else. I got enough points built into the class that each of those labs is the only should twist you up and that help with all this project and help those you up here. Okay? So if you get a D, oh my gosh, just remember, keep working, probably going to end up with a, a C. And you get one of these under your belt and you see what the exam is all about. Next one, you should have hopefully be just a touch easier. Do we get to keep the Um, no, I don't. I don't let you keep the exam, but you can set up an appointment and come in and talk to me about it. Well, final exams, it's comprehensive, but you're not going to see the exact same questions. So where we left off last time was discussing this thing called the breathing cycle. This is the model that we used to detail how air flows during ventilation. And we have two different phases of the, uh, or two different parts of the breathing cycle. Inhale or inspire to bring air in. Exhale or expire to bring air back out. Now, you do have a point between the two of these called the relaxed state. And this relaxed state basically is that time where we don't see any airflow. So there's no induced pressure gradient. So ex expiration, you're going to have airflow and you can measure coming out. Inspiration, you're going to have airflow and you can measure coming back into the lungs. The relaxed state, there's not going to be any airflow. So if there's no airflow, thinking back to our discussion on fluid dynamics and the mechanics of ventilation on Monday, if I have no airflow, no wind, what is my pressure gradient going to have to look like? Remember, the pressure gradient is created between two points. In this case, your lungs and the external environment. So it's going to be equal. So pressure in the lungs is equal to the atmospheric pressure out there in the environment. And so there's no defined concentration gradient between lungs and the external environment. So this is what's going to happen during the relaxed state. So I need to establish a volume for my thoracic cavity, the cavity that contains my lungs, that induces the pressure that's equal to the pressure out here. There's a bunch of muscles that are involved, there's a bunch of ways that we alter the size and the state of that volume of that particular container. One of them is this muscle that sits across the very bottom of the, uh, of the rib cage, it's called the diaphragm. Now during the relaxed state, that particular muscle called the diaphragm is relaxed. Now this muscle, when it's relaxed, is actually going to be domed up into the cavity. So it goes up into the cavity, and I'm over exaggerating here, but it goes up into the cavity, and so that helps to reduce the volume. So 
So we have this dome shape into the thoracic cavity. Now, there are muscles that are associated with each of our ribs. Those muscles are called intercostals. When an intercostal flexes, it's kind of like pulling up on the rib, just like if you were to pull up on a handle of a bucket away from the side of that bucket. Uh, the rib is going to be pulled away from the side of the thoracic cavity when the intercostal muscle flexes. During the relaxed state, the intercostal muscle is in a relaxed state. So that muscle between the ribs is relaxed. And so the ribs are actually set down on the thoracic cavity. They're not being pulled up and away from the thoracic cavity. In this situation, the lung pressure and the outside pressure are going to be equal. That's what the equal sign means there. So lung pressure is equal to the outside pressure. Because they're equal, there's no concentration gradient, or I'm sorry, uh, pressure gradient. Because we don't have that pressure gradient, remember that pressure gradient is what is going to allow air to flow. We go from high pressure to low pressure. Right now we have equal pressures. So there's no impetus for air flow. So no pressure gradient, so no air flow. That's going to be the relaxed state. Phase two of the breathing cycle is that inhalation phase or that inspiration phase. So inhalation, what does that mean? Air is flowing in. Now, if I want to have air flow into my lungs, what type of pressure gradient do I need to create in relation to the external environment? I need my pressure in the lungs to be lower than the pressure in the external environment. How do I create a lower pressure? What do I have to do to volume? I got to increase volume. Okay, so I've already given you a couple muscles here intercostals and the diaphragm. In the relaxed state, the diaphragm is domed up into the, um, into the thoracic cavity. So it looks like that. What is that doing to the, the volume of the lungs? It's decreasing. Now I'm going to have air flowing in. I got an increased volume. So what does this diaphragm need to do? It needs to flatten out. So when the diaphragm contracts, it actually flattens out and pulls down and away from the lungs. How about the intercostal muscles? Those are the muscles that are between the ribs. Normally that are set down on the ribs. I need to increase volume. What do those muscles need to do? They need to contract. And when they contract, they pull up on the rib cage. Okay, so just think about a bucket. If I had a big bucket of paint here or something like that, if I grab the handle and I began to pull up on it to pick the bucket up, before it leaves the floor, I'm pulling the handle up and away from the bucket. So your rib cage, as the intercostals begin to contract, those ribs, each of your 12 ribs, begin to pull up and away from the uh, thoracic cavity. So the diaphragm domes down, that increases volume. The rib cage expands up, that increases volume. Volume is much higher now in the rib cage. Pressure has dropped. Is everybody with me? So during inspiration or inhalation, The intercostal muscles contract, causing the ribs to move outward.
diaphragm contracts and that flat floor moves downward. Give me another way to put that. And the effect here of flattening the diaphragm and expanding the rib cage is to increase thoracic volume. Now, if I increase the volume of the thoracic cap, you remember I have those pleural membranes, and those pleural membranes are attached both to the thoracic cap, to the uh, near the ribs, and also to the lungs. So anytime I pull my ribs out and my diaphragm down, I'm also doing that same action to the ribs. So the thoracic cavity expands, the ribs are going to increase their volume as well. I'm sorry, I said ribs, I meant lung volume. The lungs are going to increase their volume. So, so the thoracic cavity and the lung volume all increases as those muscles contract. The diaphragm contracts as the intercostal muscles contract. Now, going back to our fluid dynamics, if volume increases, what has to happen to pressure? Pressure is going to decrease. And in particular, we're talking about the pressure in the lungs. Now, remember that I said basically when you breathe, if this is the environmental pressure, I'm just going to read that, that E and D. Environmental pressure doesn't change. It's basically a constant. At rest, that's what the lung pressure is going to look like. Now, volume increases in the lungs, pressure drops. So pressure goes from here and begins to drop. That's creating our pressure gradient. So always keep in mind that that outside pressure we're going to treat as a constant. But then the pressure in the lungs is going to significantly decrease. So as per lung pressure decreases, we get a pressure difference between our two locations. A pressure difference between the lungs as volume increases and that constant out here in the environment. And we can describe that pressure difference as being lower pressure in the lungs compared to or then outside. And the fact that we have that pressure difference where pressure is lower in the lungs than it is out here in the environment means that we have established a pressure gradient. And that pressure gradient is now going to be utilized to move air from the higher pressure location, which is the environment, to the lower pressure location, which is the lungs. So air begins to flow in. Now, I want you to think about this. I'm going to draw that picture that I just drew up there. Let's draw it again. So here's pressure in the environment. Here's where we start as we're relaxed. We drop pressure. What begins to happen as soon as we drop pressure? Air begins to flow in. That air as it flows in is going to begin to consume some of that space in the volume that we created in the lungs. So kind of the last step here in this process is we're going to have filling of that volume. Andrea, how do you borrow this? Is that all right? I'm not spilling anything. The container has a volume. There's also a fluid in that. What is that coffee? Protein shake? Okay. So we're drinking a protein shake this morning. And if I was really mean, I could go and get some water and I'd pour it in there. And what would happen to the volume of the container? Really, the volume of the container is not going to change. But the usable area or volume in that container begins to reduce as we add more and more fluid 
So pouring water is synonymous to the filling process here. So even though the volume of the container, the, I'm, I'm not changing the ribs, I'm not changing the diaphragm, the volume stays the same, but I'm <coughs> filling it up with the air as it flows in. So pressure is actually going to begin to move back up towards the environment. So filling is going to actually increase our pressure, even though the volume of the container, the lungs, isn't changing. I'm filling it up with more stuff. Pressure increases until we get back to this point right here. That's called equalization. Now, at this point right here, what's going to happen to airflow? That. There won't be any. It's going to stop. I'm not going to keep on filling it up, right? Because that would be going against a, uh, a pressure. So it's going to get to this point and it's going to stop. And that's going to be the end of inhalation once the airflow has completely stopped. All right, take a big, big deep breath in and then you're going to release everything back out. So just real quick what's going to have to happen to make air flow out in the other direction? Say again. I'm going to decrease volume of the lungs, right? I'm going to push everything back down. To make my thoracic volume and my lung volume decrease, some of the things that have to happen that flattened diaphragm, there we go. it's going to have to pop back up. The ribs, which means it's relaxing, no longer contract. The muscles between the ribs, the intercostals, those are flexed, those are contracted, and so they're pulling up on the ribs, they relax and the ribs set back down to their original starting position. So after we get to equalization, as long as we're not trying to control our breathing, we'll move into phase three. Which will be exhalation or expiration. And this starts from the end of in inhalation. So at the end of inhalation, our lung volume is still big, right? We haven't done anything to our lung volume right when this phase begins. So the lungs, I'm going to say, are expanding. They have an increased volume. Okay, so my lungs have an increased volume. Now, you keep track of what's going on with the volume here with each of the things that happen. During the exhalation phase, <coughs> the diaphragm relaxes. And remember that when the diaphragm relaxes, it domes up, and so it goes up into the cavity. So what just happened to volume of the lungs? We just decreased the volume. So when the diaphragm relaxes, moves into the cavity, the thoracic cavity affects lung volume, lung volume just drops. Our other muscles, the intercostals, they also relax. <clears throat> intercostals, when they're contracted, they pull out, they just relax, and now what happens? Swinging back in. And what happens as you swing back into volume? Decreases further. So the ribs return to their resting position. result here as diaphragm and intercostals relax, move back, move back into the rest of the position is for that thoracic cavity and of course the lung volume 
to decrease. So we start at the very beginning of this phase, this third phase called exhalation, with a increased lung volume. Now we have that muscle action that leads towards a decrease in lung volume. What happens to lung pressure? I think I heard it say a lot of drugs. Increases because we have that inverse relationship. So keep track of that inverse relationship between pressure and volume. So if lung volume decreases, lung pressure has to increase. Now, that pressure is going to work on the fluid. The fluid is the air. I've just increased pressure on that air, if I increase it above my external environment pressure, what's going to begin to happen? So I have lung pressure here is what's really high, environment is lower, high to low from lungs to the environment. Always remember that the outside pressure doesn't change. Outside pressure is a constant. So lung pressure is high, outside pressure is constant. We've created again a pressure difference. That pressure difference Pressure's higher in the lungs than outside. We again call that the pressure gradient. And when we have high pressure in the lungs, lower pressure outside, that's our concentration gradient, or that's our pressure gradient, and so this favors movement of the fluid air from the lungs to outside. So air moves on. Now, once again, as air begins to flow out of the lungs, what is happening to the volume in the lungs? So air is flowing out. That means we're losing. It would be just like pouring that container out. You now have more open space in there. More volume. If I have more volume, what's happening to pressure? Less pressure. So really, we kind of have that first initial uh, behind the prep, behind the airflow it begins to flow out, and then it dissipates, and eventually it'll stop. Again, it stops when we get to equalization. And at this point, we now can return back to phase one, what we call the relaxed state. We're in that relaxed state, no airflow, we're getting ready to go back through inhalation. So if you come up and you punch someone in the gut, and they go, boom, why do they do that? Yeah, when you punch them, you're forcing organs and things like that up into the thoracic cavity, instantaneously decreasing the lung volume, increasing pressure. If it's a hard enough punch, increases pressure enough that air will pull up. That would be a great way to fight to like, tell them exactly what's happening physiologically as you're punching them to death. What's that? <laughs> Now, using this idea of creating pressure gradients, we can actually begin to apply how big the pressure gradient is that's being induced to how much volume of air we're going to see exchanged. And those are called lung volumes. And humans should have 
some pretty typical lung volumes. And those lung volumes can change for a variety of reasons, um, sometimes for exercise and things like that, but other times for diagnostic features. If you're a smoker, you change your lung volume, and it's going to result in a different appearance of this chart here, which is a lung volume chart. So um, you go to a pulmonologist, his doctor specializes in lung physiology, and they may measure their lung volumes. And using information from, uh, from this figure that um, details how big or how wide those curves are, they can give you an idea of how well your lungs are functioning. So it becomes very diagnostic. I believe on Friday, this is going to be part of the lab that you do is actually look at lung volumes. You're going to capture air that you expire out and be able to touch with some of these for you or for a lab partner. So, lung volumes, did you already do that or is that? Okay, I think you're doing it on Friday. So, lung volumes become a diagnostic feature or a diagnostic tool. Uh, and I want to just sort of introduce you to the lung volumes um, so you can see what they are and what they actually measure. Even at rest, your lungs always have air in them. That you never fully get rid of air. If you do, the lung collapses and either you don't ever refill the lung and you die, or um, when you refill it, it's really, really painful. In fact, even if you're a dead person, you still have air inside of your lungs because that quality can see in your head. So there's air always in the lungs. And for the average adult, it's right around two and a half liters. And that's at rest or during that relaxed state. So you can see right up here, there's a line drawn on this figure that correlates to about 2,500 milliliters. This is all in milliliters, so that liter just multiplied by 1,000. 2,500 liters. This is basically your zero point, so to speak. This is where we're going to move. Uh, we're going to move from. So if we breathe in, what's going to happen to air uh, to volume of air in the lungs? Breathing in, we're going to see air go up. So it's going to go up from our 2.5 liters towards 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 milliliters. How about if I exhale, blow air out? drops down, and it's going to go down from 2.5 liters or 2,500 milliliters down from 2,000 to 1,000, but never reaching zero. So if we're always sort of at that set point of 2.5 liters, when we breathe or when we ventilate, that breathing is what results in changes relative to the air that's contained. So what I'm saying here relative to the contained air, relative to that 2.5 liters, breathing is going to change us from 2.5 going up for inspiration, going down from 2.5 for exhalation. All right, so what are some of the volumes that we can measure? Right now, all of you are just sitting here, and I hope you're breathing. So you have some air coming in and air going out. It's not very labored. You probably don't even notice it somehow. I'm just being aware of it. That's called tidal breathing. It's just normal, just normal everyday, um, non-exertional breathing. The volume that is achieved during tidal breathing is called the tidal volume. So this is just your normal resting breathing. Tidal volume is the normal resting breathing. So starting from our start point there at 2,500 milliliters, as I breathe in, 
I tend up towards almost 3,000 milliliters, and then I breathe out and I tend back down towards about two and a half liters. So there's about this 500 milliliter shift from our resting point up to about 3,000 that you, every time you breathe, you're moving that 500 milliliters in, 500 milliliters back out, 500 milliliters in, 500 milliliters back out. So on average, your tidal volume is going to be 500 milliliters. Typically, you breathe between 12 and 20 breaths in a minute at rest for most students. You're actually going to count that on a partner or a lab partner um, when you do this lab. And you'll be able to calculate uh, average tidal volume. You'll capture the air that you breathe out. And you'll look at the number of times that you breathe, capture each time you breathe out, and then you'll be able to calculate that average, that average tidal volume for each individual. And hopefully it'll be right around 500 milliliters. I will warn you that most of the time when you start um, measuring breathing rates and things like that, it will be just pretty normal and lab subject will look like it's your normal breathing. <laughs> Just breathe normal. <laughs> no, normal. <laughs> You're gonna panic. Another volume that we can measure is called the. That's uh, supposed to be inspiratory, not inspiration. Is the inspiratory reserve. Okay, so inspiration, real quick, is it an increase or a decrease in volume for inspiration? Increase? Yep, so increase. Bringing air in. The inspiratory reserve, you can see right here, from the peak of a tidal volume, it's basically everything else that you can fit into your lungs. Your lungs are going to have a total lung volume. It's roughly up around 6,000 for most of us, 6,000 milliliters of air. You can take a huge, big, deep breath, like getting ready to blow out hurt the candles. Fill up your, your lungs with the maximum amount of air as possible. It actually hurts a little bit when you get up around that 6,000 milliliters. But from the top of that curve to the very top of your lung volume is going to be that inspiratory reserve. So really, the definition here for inspiratory reserve is that lung capacity for more air. So the capacity for more air. After you've breathed in during a tidal breath, you still have volume in reserve, or hopefully you still have volume in reserve that you can call on if, let's say, workload increases. So exercise, you're actually going to begin to have a higher rate of breathing. And hopefully you have plenty of reserve, the more reserve that you have, the more oxygen and CO2 exchange that you can create through ventilation to support that work that's being done. So this is just your capacity for more air. It's what you have in reserve from a tidal inspiration. You can measure this by taking a deep breath in and measuring the volume of air that you take in in that deep breath. And just try to get as much air as possible into your lungs. On the other side, going in this direction, you have an expiratory reserve. The expiratory reserve is going to be that volume from that bottom of the tidal breath that you can get rid of or expel out of your lungs. Now, I've already told you, you're never going to be able to go to zero. So you're going to have a maximum amount of air that you can get rid of or that you can release. This is like blowing on your birthday candles. Now, take in a really big deep breath and then blow everything out that you can possibly blow out. And if you have as many candles on your cake as I, as I do, it takes all of your expired reserves to knock all of them out. 
I'm going to get much older and I'm not going to be able to do it anymore. So this is the maximum volume that you can release in a single expiration. Now again, as I've already hounded on, let's just beat the dead horse a little more here. Do not reduce to zero. You're never going to empty your lungs completely out. Never going to be able to eliminate all of the air. So that means that you're always going to have a little bit of air, even at maximum expiration, that's left over. It's residual or left over. So we're going to call that your residual volume. Now, it's kind of hard to directly measure residual volume, but you can estimate or calculate residual volume. If you measure your total lung volume, which we can estimate total lung volume, and then you take and try to blow your birthday candle out, suck in as much air as you can, blow as much out as possible, take that minus your total lung volume, and that gives you your leftover residual volume. So that residual volume is that air that remains after you've eliminated the maximum amount of air during exhalation. <laughs> so, if I want to measure my inspiratory reserve, which is this part of the curve right here, I just take in as big of a breath as I can. If I want to measure my um, expiratory reserve, then from my baseline, I breathe out as much as possible. If I take both of those and put them together and the tidal volume here, and breathe in and breathe out, just like I'm getting ready to blow out my birthday candles, that whole thing is called the vital capacity. So the vital capacity is really the total volume of air that can be ventilated. It's not your total lung volume, but just simply the portion of your total lung volume that you can ventilate. And I'm using that term ventilate to just describe to move air into or out of the lungs. The very last here is your total lung capacity. Your total volume or your total lung capacity is the absolute volume of your lungs. And this total lung capacity or the total lung volume is always related to body size. So total lung volume, we don't really ever measure that directly in a living human. We can estimate it with a couple of different techniques, but we can measure it in a cadaver. Right, so I can take a cadaver and I can fill up the lungs with as much air as I possibly can get in there. And that's going to relate to the total volume for, uh, for that individual's lungs. Then I can make some other measurements related a lot of times to body size because it's really easy to measure height and weight, things like that. And I can put those into an equation that I've regressed or created from the cadaver's total volume and I can estimate your total volume. So that's one of the ways that we can get at total lung volume. So for the most part, that total lung volume related to body size typically sets bias, meaning women, 
smaller body size, smaller total volume. Men, larger body size, larger total volume. Now, if you're a smoker, or if you have asthma, or if you have other conditions such as emphysema, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or bronchitis, this changes how air can flow into and out of the lungs. And it may reduce some of these volumes. And so you may not have as much of a inspiratory reserve volume. Or it may lengthen how long it takes. You still might be able to get in the same amount of air, but it takes a longer amount of time. And so you know the curve may it may just simply be shorter. Normally it's much taller. Or it may be the same height, but it takes a much longer time. So looking at the shape of the curve, or what we would call the morphology of the curve, it can help us to determine how effective that individual's ventilation ability capabilities are. And that's one of the reasons that we would use this sort of a, um, this sort of a, a graph or figure. It's called a spiral graph um, to keep track of respiratory capacity and respiratory volumes for individuals who have pathophysiological conditions. In the final few minutes here, which I have about uh, seven minutes, I want to talk about gas exchange. So up to this point, we've really just been discussing how do we move air into and out of the lungs. What does it look like? What types of volumes should we expect, etc. Once I move air into the lungs, I have to move that air from the alveoli into the bloodstream. I have to exchange air from the alveoli into the blood. This is a process called gas exchange. And gas exchange is actually a very common biological problem or biological situation. We you have to, in all sorts of biological situations, move gases across from one container to another container. And it happens at all levels of biology. In the case of humans, we have to exchange gas in LOVI into the blood. We have to exchange gas from the blood into the extracellular fluid or the tissue. We have to exchange uh, gases from the tissue fluid into the cell. Those are each those three different, uh, the three other levels of uh, respiratory system function: external respiration, alveoli to blood; internal respiration from the blood to the tissue, and then cellular respiration once we get into the cell to take that oxygen and convert it into um, into ATP in the presence of uh, uh, carbohydrates. So those are all gas exchange processes. We're going to start out with the gas exchange where we're dealing with taking gases, individual gases from the air, and putting them into the blood, or vice versa. Air to blood or blood into air. In order to accomplish this gas exchange, we have to diffuse individual molecules of gas across two cell layers. We're going to have to move those gases across the cells of the alveoli, the alveoli and across the blood capillary, or the cell of the blood capillary. Looks like you back. Yes, I can. So if we get down into the microanatomy of the lungs, we're going to have those ball-shaped or balloon-shaped structures called the alveoli, and we're going to have the cells of the capillary. So this is our blood in here. And then this is going to be air here. Now, what's really interesting about this is each of the individual gases that we find in air, things like oxygen and nitrogen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, they will cross this barrier differently. So it's going to be 
it's going to be ingredient dependent. Oxygen flows in, carbon dioxide flows out, regardless of the total pressure. <coughs> Each individual molecule is going to travel from one location to another location based off of the individual pressures that each of those gases contribute to the total pressure. I'm going to get into this and explain in a lot more detail. Um, probably have to start that on uh, the Monday after the break. It's going to be a great cliffhanger. So really, in order to understand this effectively, we have to talk about the air that's in this room right now. And that air that's in this room right now has got a variety of different characteristics that it's trapped. Anyone happen to know what the total air pressure is typically here in Cleveland, Georgia? How does it compare to, let's say, on top of, uh, I don't know, Denali Mons, Denali Mons? Really, really low up high, really high down here. And that's what you're seeing in this picture here. So I guess we're looking at Mount Everest. So maybe we're over in the Himalayas. Um, so Mount Everest, up here, there are far fewer gas particles, far fewer molecules. Down here, all of the molecules are getting tracked towards the surface. And that makes a lot of sense because we're on a big, big ball that's spinning around. And if it's heavier, it's getting pulled by gravity closer to the center of the Earth. Okay. So we begin to have more gases down here. Because there's more stuff down here, it's higher pressure. So typically, in terms of Cleveland, Georgia, roughly about 2,000 feet above sea level here in Cleveland, we're going to experience something about uh, something like uh, air pressure is about 760 millimeters of mercury. As you go up toward these really high mountains in the Himalayas or in the Rockies, we're going to begin to see that 760 begin to drop down, 500, 400. Okay, and that just is because the total amount of material that's present is much, much lower. So 760 millimeters of mercury. And I'm going to give you two more notes, and then I'm going to call it quits for the day. This air at 760 millimeters of mercury is also going to be composed of various gases. So air is a mixture of different types of gases. Those gases are going to include nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide in particular. There's actually a few other things in the air as well, but they're very low concentration, so we don't have to worry as much about that. Anyone happen to remember from a physical science class in high school, the percentage of nitrogen that we have here in our air, the percentage of oxygen in the air? I'm, I'm guessing you're going to probably remember. Nitrogen's the highest. It's about 78% of the total gas right now is this inert nitrogen. Oxygen is right around 21%. And then our lowest is CO2, which in the environment here is really only about 0.04%. So air is comprised of these three and a few other gases. And each of these is going to have their own pressure and the total is going to add up to my 760 millimeters of mercury. So that's where I'll leave you. Um, I'm going to be in my office today if you have questions for the exam. I'll be in my office tomorrow morning, but I'll be away from my office after chapel. And I, won't, I will not be back until the Monday after break, or I'll see you the next time, Monday after break. So if you have questions, feel free to stop by in the next 24 hours or so. Um, or send me an email and we can converse over email.